Welcome back. And this is a special one. This is episode number 20 of Food for Thought Live. So thank you very much for joining us. I know some of you have joined us for all 20 episodes, and uh, I'm just overwhelmed by that. I think it's incredible that we've got to that point already, and the fact that you guys have been so supportive of this, and all of my guests, and uh, everyone up to this point, it's just amazing. Thank you so much for, for making this what it is. I'm, I'm thrilled to be back, I, and I genuinely can't believe that, you know, just, it was May 11th was our first episode, May 11th. And what are we now? June, July 2nd, July 1st, July 2nd. What's the date? I don't know. Anyway, it's July and, and it's not even two months. And here we are 20 episodes in. Um, it's been wonderful. Thank you. Good night. That's not it. We're going to, we're going to do some more tonight. Um, but before we do, I just want to say this has been a wonderful week where uh, if you've been following social media, you'll know that we now have uh, two squirrels <laughs> in, in residence. They're not here, at the, neither of them are here at the moment, but we now have Kiki and D. That's official, and I can t very proudly tell you that Kiki D literally gave her nod of approval on this. And so that was through tw Twitter, where she very graciously said that she thinks that Kiki's a very sweet gal and gave the, the thumbs up, and also Born Free very kindly <laughs> contacted Kiki D. And I mean this, I'm absolutely serious on very important squirrel related business. And she gave the uh, the nod of approval it's for for um, Kiki's new friend to be D. So it's Kiki D um, officially. So thank you very much for uh, to Kiki D for, for that. I never thought I'd be saying that sentence. Um, <clears throat> thank you to my 19 wonderful guests prior to this, including the, the most recent uh, guest, Liz Tyson from the Born Free USA Primate Sanctuary. That was an amazing conversation. She's an amazing person and what incredible work they do there. And speaking of incredible work, it's really, really difficult to summarize without um, sounding gushy what my guest this evening has achieved. And but of course, that's what we're gonna talk about. Um, but it's, it's such a pleasure and an honor because this is a great dear friend of mine, as well as being an incredible, uh, effective, powerful conservationist, my friend, Margot Raggett. Hi. All right. <laughs> How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. Good to see Look you. Look at that. We got Margot on. I've been looking forward to this. We spoke about this before it started, didn't we? Yeah, you said I'm thinking of doing this thing, and I said, "Sounds brilliant, go for it." So, um, yeah. yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Oh, we're so happy to have you here. And you guys, who uh, it will, have, a lot of you seen the promo poster that I that I shared, um, will know what Margot's responsible for. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about this tonight, uh, and we're going to talk about a lot of different species because of it and what we're talking about so far so far are these four incredible books which i'm very proud to have copies of um and they're just staggering staggering books a lot of you will know them if you don't you're in for a treat because we're going to point you towards where you can get them and margot's going to tell the whole story about how this has come to be so with that in mind margot where should we start i mean god where should we start right at the beginning yeah, I think so. Um, I, I think we need to, to to take it right back to the beginning with elephants. Um, yeah. And and yeah, I mean, the, the story is, um, and forgive me, some people might know this, but um, I was um, spending a lot of time trying to build a career as a wildlife photographer out in Kenya. Um, and um, in 2014, I was up in northern Kenya in, in Lakipia, a wonderful place called the Lakipia Wilderness Camp. And um, I'd been having a great safari. This was the end of a trip to, to Kenya, um, all about photography at that stage. Um, and we got woken up in the middle of the night by hyenas, the noise of hyenas going absolutely crazy close to camp. Um, I think it was like 4.30 in the morning, um, just a lot of hyenas and very unusual. So we knew something had happened. So at first light, like 5.30, we were out in the, the vehicle, went to the area. Um, you can get out on foot in that particular place. So kind of tracked behind the guide to see what was happening. And we turned a corner and um, and, and saw a very shocking sight. Um, I know that you've got um, a picture which, you know, I'll let you flash it up in a bit. But basically what we saw was 
um, an elephant who'd been poached. Um, and mm. he was probably about 14 years old. He had relatively tiny tusks because he's just a little teenager. Um, he's of that age that as an elephant, he would have been kicked out of the herd. So male elephants are kind of pushed out over time because um, elephant herds are matriarchal. So as they get older, males go off and they're either solitary or they they join up with a few other males um, as, a, as a group. But this young teenager was no doubt alone. Um, and someone had shot him with a poisoned arrow. Um, and uh, it was just, I was saying, how the, you know, how could this happen? And why is it happening? He's still got his tusks, it wasn't poachers. And, and they said, no, no doubt he um, escaped the poachers. So they shot him, he would have run off um and kept running so got away yeah. from them but then the poison would have taken you know three or four days to kill him and the sight of that the knowledge of that the everything about that experience was horrific and overwhelming and just hit me in a way i think i'd never really been hit before mm. um, and i just didn't know how to process that emotion and then i just thought i can't i'm i just thought, i'm not having this like no i am not having it mm. and i thought you know you can post a really angry post on facebook but that's that's not enough you know i actually have to practically do something about this because like, i'm not having this um I'm having and just. i mean what can i do and 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 what you've done is absolutely staggering but, but i don't want to do you a disservice i am going to share this photograph but you guys watching know I don't share graphic images. I certainly don't do it gratuitously, but I think this is important. And the reason why I'm, I'm saying this for two reasons. One, because as you can hear from what Margot's telling you, that's the whole reason we're here having this conversation is because this is what sparked it off and inspired Margot to make this incredible campaign real. But I'm also telling you because I'm gonna give you a chance to avert your eyes should you wish to, because I don't want to I don't want to destroy any of you guys. This is upsetting, of course, um, but I think it's important. Well, it is important. Look at what Margot has achieved. And by the end of this conversation, you'll know just what Margot has achieved so far because of this. So it doesn't matter whether you're watching this live or whether you're watching the recording subsequent to the live event. I'm going to give you three seconds to avert your eyes if you don't want to see a poached elephant. This is what Margot's talking about. <clears throat> and why is that not behaving itself? Sorry, guys. Doesn't want to be shown. No. It's, it, it, literally, I'm I'm clicking on the slide right there. It just doesn't want to be shown. That's that's all right. That's not. It's like it's like a sign from the universe. It doesn't want to be shown. I've no idea why that's happening. Let me see if it's un if it's hidden or something. Isn't that strange? Yeah. Hold well, on. don't worry, Dan. I mean, I think that um, people can even see in the thumbnail and, and people can imagine what it is. Um, yeah, but I, I think, think it, is, it is important. I think it is important. I've got no idea why that slide isn't showing. It's quite bizarre. You can see the slide before it and the slide after it's showing, but that slide's not. Yeah. So I'm not sure why, but uh, I can't see any unhide slide option. Maybe it's just a sign that we're not supposed to show it. Yeah, I think um, so. But I think, I mean, oh, whether yeah. you can see it or not, I think that the the point is that actually this whole series is in his memory. And um, and there's a philosophy I've got from it. You know, I, I just thought if I can do anything, you know, he, he was personal for me, you know, and it, it, I know you feel exactly the same about this as I do, Dan, but, you know, I, I, these animals are sentient beings with their own lives and their own personality. And we've got no right to remove that life or take it away. And, you know, for him, um, I just thought, you know, if I can stop one other elephant from having the same fate as he did, from going through the same pain um, as he did, um, the horror, you know, the, as an apology to him on behalf of all the horrible humans that have poached so many elephants, then, then I'll have achieved something. Um, and I, I stand to that philosophy. I think that it's, you know, conservation is is such a mammoth task and it, it, it can be overwhelming sometimes that you think, you know, that, that you get bombarded with bad news all the time and, and you think, God, are we achieving anything? All these, you know, decades and decades of conservation work, are we achieving anything? And I thought, no, if I can prevent 
one death like that, then we have achieved something. And, you know, so, so, you know, that's why I'm doing it. And, and, you know, I, 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 we had a very good example of that when we'll come on to it, but, you know, you and I then went out to Kenya after um, Remembering Elephants came out and, and we had a perfect example of how we'd actually averted a, a poaching incident because of sales of Remembering Elephants. So, um, yeah, I just I think for everyone who gets overwhelmed by conservation sometimes and what we achieve, remember my elephant um, and, and we're doing it for him. You know, I think one of the things that I have to say, Margot, about you as, a, as an individual is that you have this incredible ability to, like, I guess this comes down to your, your PR corporate background, you're, you've got a very logical mind and uh, alongside your compassion and sensitivity, you're able to apply that to such great effect because what you've done, and I'd love for you to talk about this, co the concept of the books, what you've done is you've create, you've simplified for people a way in which they can contribute. And, and, it's, it, and it's so simple, it's genius, and it's so unique, and it certainly was unique at the time that, it was, that you, you, you created it. Um, and I kind of want to, I want to jump right to a question that Darren Coombs, one of our wonderful supporters has asked, can I still buy the books? Yes, you can. I'm going to share with you the, the website where you can buy the books. In fact, I can see Ashley James very kindly has shared it already at rememberingwildlife.com. All of the books are still available. And Margot, please tell us a little bit just about the, the concept, the idea behind how the, this works right from the start in terms of pulling it together, raising the funds and then selling the books. Yeah, so um, these beautiful books are, um, none of these photographs are my photographs, I should um, emphasize. Um, they are only possible because I managed to persuade um, a lot of the biggest names in wildlife photography in the world to collaborate together um, and to all donate <clears throat> an image each to um, initially, as I just thought it was going to be a one-off book, Remembering Elephants. So. I started that first year thinking I just want 50 photographers because that sounded like a nice round number and I, I didn't actually know 50 at the time. I, I knew um, about 20, but started just researching the best images I could find out there because what I wanted to do is put a, a book together that was a tribute and the most beautiful book ever seen on elephants. Um, and so therefore I could pick and choose what I thought were the most beautiful pictures out there of elephants in one collection. And that had never been done before. Lots of photographers had done their own books. And, you know, there are things like Wildlife Photographer of the Year, which are, are compilations, but a very species specific book um, with all of the best work in one place that had never really been done before. Mm. Um, and I should just explain the, the title as well, Remembering Elephants. Um, uh, around the time that the book started to kind of formulate in my mind, I saw an interview with um, Jane Goodall, um, Dr. Jane Goodall, a um, very famous conservationist, and she was talking about the rate of poaching of elephants, that there are around 400,000 elephants left, um, and they were being poached at around 30 to 40,000 elephants a year. So at that rate, if you extrapolate it, within 10 to 15 years, there might not be any wild elephants left. And, and when I saw her say that, I can remember it was on BBC Breakfast, I kind of sat down in shock at that thought that in our lifetime, there might not be wild elephants left. And it was done on our watch. Um, so I thought, okay, I, I obviously, I don't want that to happen. That's what I'm fighting to prevent with the publication of this book. But, um, you know, let's imagine a world where it has happened. Um, and this is the tribute to what they had been like uh, you know that 20 years ago um and that was such an emotional thought to me it could bring me mm. to tears and um and i thought yeah that i need to provoke people into to thinking you know that, that this is a reality that could happen so some people get a bit funny with me and say oh you shouldn't call it that you know they're still around but i'm being deliberately provocative this is what we might only be remembering these animals in picture books if we if we don't get our act together yeah I, yeah I mean it's a it's a hard reality to comprehend even the prospect of but as you say you need you need to be provocative with it we need to inspire people to take action and um and of course as I've alluded to you've done that in a way that's I think incredibly incredibly clever um 
all the way from the inset, the, the creation, the inception of the idea, how it works, as you've just talked about gathering donated photographs from some of the best photographers in the world for the ultimate collection of this specific species at the time. And, and of course, to begin with, it was elephants. But then, of course, the whole means by which you enable people to contribute to the creation of the book, the, the actual physical production of the book, therefore enables you to sell it, meaning all profits go to the, the cause because the book's paid for. You're not paying off a publishing house or whatever it is. To just walk us through that, that, yeah, uh, that so part of it as well. Yeah, um, so um, we use a, a crowdfunding platform called Kickstarter. Um, and the idea is that if we've just finished the Kickstarter for this year, so there isn't a Kickstarter live right now, but when we're running them, um, we ask people to buy in advance the book. So we say this book will be on sale in October for £45, but buy it now on Kickstarter for £40 um, and effectively give us the cash flow to make the book. Um, and not only that, but people can buy sets of three, they can buy limited edition books. Um, and um, in, in that first year, I think I had one or two other items that were also donated that I could sell on Kickstarter. But over time, it's, it's really grown. So um, we've had some wonderful um, safari operators donating safaris for us to sell some amazing artists who've become very good personal friends of mine as well and um, like karen lawrence rowe and gary hodges um donating um work for us to sell on on the kickstarter and and really it's you know a, a, a feast of goodies if you love wildlife that people can um you know support us with buy the books in advance and that then pays for us to make the book um so then when we actually get the books printed um, and you know and delivered and, and published in October each year they've all been paid for um, you know they're all bought outright so we, we give the books that were bought before and then I've got a stock of books that I want to sell to as many people as I possibly can and then all of the profits as you say from from the books that we've got um, can then go in the pot and and help us to raise money so the commitment has always been all of the profits from from this entire series goes to conservation um and um i have to say in that first year with elephants i set myself a target of raising a hundred thousand pounds which right. se seemed like a staggering amount to me i i really i i kind of thought that sounds great that wouldn't that be amazing um but didn't <laughs> really expect that we would achieve it but um but yeah that, that's how it works shall we i mean I, i'm just going to go grab a copy of the, one of the books to show people but uh, you, an entire, and this isn't a loaded question. We can tell people this later, um, or you can talk about the total. Because obviously, we, you, you guys have seen that it started with elephants, as Margot's describing how that started. But we've since then seen rhinos, great apes, lions, and this year, current the current book is is cheetahs. Do you want to tell tell the guys that this? So keeping in mind that hundred thousand that seems so huge, that mammoth target that you had back in the day. Please, while I go get this book, to, if you'd like to tell yeah. people where you are at now. Yeah, um, yeah, in, incredibly. So we have, um, I think as of last month, we've now donated £628,550. Um, we've supported 40 different projects um, in, I think it's 33 different countries. Um, it's... It, it, I, I can hardly believe it, really. Um, but as you say, I, we, I, I just luckily struck on something that um, that really works and that people love. Um, you know, people want to buy these books, gift them to people, own these books, and when they're doing that, you know, not only are they getting something beautiful, but they're actually helping us to give funds to projects that desperately now more than ever need those money or that money. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I adore you for many reasons, one of which is your humility, because I know, and, and, and I hope you won't mind me saying this, but because we've, we've become very close friends over the, the few years that we've known each other, um, I have the benefit of, I think benefit of anyway, seeing your, 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 um, your fears, your doubts, your, you've, you and I have sat many times over a cup of coffee talking about your fears of like, is this going to work? Is it, are people going to go for this? Is and and maybe that's the species you've chosen or maybe that's just because it's the, se the second or third or fourth will people still still be interested i've got to ho hold you up on one of the things that you just said there where you got really lucky that you stumbled upon a, a successful formula you didn't get lucky you created something incredible which which by the way i've seen 
mimicked a number of times since, which I think speaks volumes. Is because you know, and and I'm, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, by the way. I'm just saying that when you know when when that starts to happen, people realise that it's an incredibly good, effective, powerful, brilliant idea, and you've seen that happen a lot since your uh, since your first book. But nothing has has stemmed the flow of supporters towards the Remembering Wildlife series. It's just been incredible, and the and the growth. And the, the number you just said, 620 some thousand pounds, did you say? Yeah, 628,550. <laughs> um, I'm sick of these approximations. How many <laughs> pence? Um, <laughs> um, it's, a, it's an in incredible achievement because you're right. You're right with what you said back in the day. 100,000 pounds is an enormous amount of money. If I was to set out today to achieve 100,000 pound fundraising, for anything it would be i'd be like wow how am i going to do this and not only have you done that but you've nearly it's nearly seven times that now and we're not even close to finished and that's an incredible achievement and it's nothing to do with luck it's all to do with you and what you've done and the passion and drive behind what you've done i know firsthand um so i'm not guessing i've seen i've seen you go through the thick and thin of all this and it's absolutely incredible so this isn't a goodbye by the way we're only 20 minutes into this but i want to just say a huge thank you for what you've created because it's staggering and and most importantly it's achieved what you set out to achieve which is that it helps the species every single book that you sell whether it's elephants rhinos great apes lions here it is and i wanted to show you this for, for a reason guys so you get a, a sense of the scale i have a normal human head here <laughs> that's how this is one of those books that everyone's buying at christmas everybody's buying for as a gift for somebody else or for their for their for themselves just for pleasure the photographs are literally world class photographs you can't i'm just opening the page randomly there's not a there's not a single page where you're going to see a photograph that doesn't just melt you blow your mind it's it's staggering all of these books are incredible there's no person that doesn't need one of these and um, would benefit from having one. And, it, and and when I say benefit, I mean it literally, because this is what Margot's created, is the ability for you to get something as beautiful as that, a collector's edition. You could get this whole collector's set and every penny of it. And I've had the privilege, which we'll get into talking about in a moment. I had the privilege of going with Margot to Africa specifically because Margot absolutely insists on transparency. So you get to see where your money's been spent and how it has directly impacted conservation positively. That, Margot Raggett, is what you've done. Bless you, thank you. Um, and I um, I also should thank you for um, being my counsellor many times over the years, because you're right. I I mean, maybe it's a good thing. I, I, I genuinely feel concern and insecurity about, you know, if I bored everyone by making too many books you know will, will, will people still want to be there this year and and maybe that keeps you know I mean it's better than being arrogant and complacent I'm sure yeah. but um yeah. but yeah I, I it does rack me sometimes with worry so um you've been a, a, a wonderful sounding board to, to tell me not to be so stupid over the years which I really appreciate oh, well it's, an, it's been it's been an honor and it's and it's been a pleasure um, and I do and I do I actually agree with you wholeheartedly I think it's really uh, it's a really um, admirable quality, and I think it's something that has has actually lent itself very, very well to the the ongoing success of the of the campaign and the and the series. Because you, there's not been a moment where you've thought, oh yeah, this is going to be a walk in the park. I know that for a fact because I've been with you where you've 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 been fretting uh, on the eve of the Kickstarter launch, or you've been fretting on the eve of the the RGS event, and all these incredible things that you've done, and all of which have been a storming success. But at no point have you ever gone into it thinking yeah of course it's going to be a success i i have <laughs> i've had I, I get to sit back and just go well, no, i know it's going to work but you don't because you've got this beautiful humility about you and you're so invested in this because you know how much it matters not just to you but to the to the to the conservation groups that you support and to the animals most importantly because every single penny of it is is literally saving lives and we've seen that and so so that's my gush over there'll probably be more i am going to gush a little bit more a little Thanks. later, but we'll, we'll I'll, I'll give you a little I'll give you a breather <laughs> for a couple of minutes. Um, so it it was it was elephants first. Yeah. And and I met you right after you created the Remembering Elephants books, and we we had I, we we connected on social media. Thank thank you, social media. 
and I've been a very, very proud ambassador for you since. And uh, and I couldn't be prouder. I think it's it's an incredible, incredible endeavor that, that you have created and that I'm a part of. And then because of that, because of the fact that we connected in, um, obviously had this shared passion, you made the big mistake of saying, hey, we should go to Africa. And I think before you'd finished the uh of Africa, I'd booked my flight. <laughs> This is true. This is true. Um, it was quite a spontaneous thing, wasn't it? With a, a, Lucky it worked out because I think we'd known each other for about a week when we decided <laughs> yeah. that we'd go and see how some of the money was being spent just to make sure it was being spent correctly. And um, yeah, yeah. yeah what, a, what a happy start to a friendship that was. So, yeah. What a happy start. And we ended up seeing some incredible things. Uh, these slides are go What's going on? Uh, I've, I've sent you a duff presentation, haven't I? Yeah, what's going on, Margot? That's the that back to Kenya distributing funds is a let's is try a this note that I I have behind it. Click on the next one, see if that works. Oh no. Oh no. This can't happen. Who knows how to use keynote? Tell us. Hold on, let's see, let's see what happens if I do this. Yeah, and then and then use the forward arrow. And oh, do it again. I don't no. Uh, I yeah. think it's gonna work. Did you see that? Yeah, that worked. Let's see. Can I pause it, or does it just go when I tell it to? Does that? <laughs> what am I getting this for? Well, look. Uh, remember, we have. To, I'll tell you what. I know I've got the photograph that comes next in the deck. Right. So I'll find it while you, while you uh, whistle the British Airways theme tune or something. <laughs> if only I could whistle like some. Um, it, yeah, that's so an in joke. Yeah, the picture you were going to show um, is is basically, I think actually you took it and it's of me um, and we're in, in Meru in northern Kenya, um, which yeah. is, uh, so for the first three books, I partnered with the Born Free Foundation. So at, at that stage, I was just starting out and not sure how best to spend funds, very aware that there's a, a high chance of money going to the wrong causes in Africa or going missing in Africa. So I wanted to kind of work with a partner I could trust and Born Free were, were great for that. Um, and so, yeah, we, we went to Meru where they have a, um, a sort of headquarters up in Kenya. And and there we had paid, um, our funds have been used to put tires on 10 anti-poaching vehicles. Um, they uh, We also paid to have fuel for six months for those vehicles. Um, and we also paid to fix what's called a grading machine um, which uh, basically the roads get very churned up with the mud in the in the rainy season out in in Africa, and if you leave car kind of grooves from the tires, they become impassable when those solidify almost like hard as as concrete. So the, a grading machine can kind of cut smooth off the top of the road and make it passable for rangers to get to parts of of the Meru Park that they actually couldn't get to before the the grader was fixed. Um, so as an aside, we had the fun job of actually getting to drive the grader. I'll tell everyone I was better at it than Dan. He'll probably deny that. But um, I was an excellent grading driver. <laughs> um, you've gone quiet now, Dan. I can't hear you. I muted myself because this, there was a police car going by. Uh, OK, you're back. Which happens a lot around here. This area is going down the pan. <laughs> um, but anyway, but the the the... The, uh, apart from teasing you about our competitiveness for driving the grader, um, the, the the thing that happened when we were in Meru that um, really brought everything home to me and, and kind of cemented that we did have something that really worked here was, um, I know you'll remember this, we, we woke up one morning to go for our safari drive and, and when we were all meeting for breakfast, um, there was a lot of hushed talk and people going around the lodge discussing things and we were saying, what's going on? You know, yeah. And they said, well, actually there were poachers in the park last night um, and um, gunshots were heard. Um, but our rangers, uh, because of the tyres we put on their vehicles, because of the fuel they had, because the yeah. roads were passable again, had been yeah. in the area, um, had exchanged fire by shooting in the air. Um, and actually, um, the poachers obviously heard that and disappeared. So in the morning, they were still searching that when we were all having our coffee um, and wondering what was going on to see if, they could find that the you know any evidence of a, a poached animal and thank god they didn't um they found um cartridges from guns so they right. tried to, to poach but 
it had been averted um, because of the money that we'd been able to put into that anti-poaching effort. So my dream of saving one elephant as a, you know, that, and at that point I've been working for about 18 months on this book yeah. um, and we just sent the money out um, was, was proven that it actually worked, um, which was an amazing feeling. I, I'm sure you remember it. I, I remember it very well. And it was what struck me aside from the, the, almost surreal nature of the fact that there we were in because I remember we were out on a game drive that evening right the way through past sunset into the into the blue hour which is what they call it when the sun has gone and there's a half hour 45 minute or hour period of that incredible blue light after the sun has set before it's too dark and and it was that time that it was supposedly happening um w which we subsequently found out the next morning but we literally were out in the in the park while a poaching attempt was being made and that hit me like a ton of bricks but also what hit me was the fact that and I think this is something you had said preemptively you'd said all along you know there's nothing glamorous about tires and fuel for vehicles there's no it's not putting a, a big feeding bottle into a baby elephant's mouth which is where people are like oh my god and they and they donate it's it's not the obvious stuff but that was the difference between an, an animal living or dying you providing the tires, you providing the grading machine. I remember, I'll never forget that grading machine. It was like something, it was like out of the Transformers movie. And I <laughs> couldn't believe that we got to drive it. And it literally, as you described, it flattens the road so that it's passable by vehicle. But then, of course, if the vehicles don't have tires or fuel, it doesn't matter how flat the road is, they're still not going to get to the poachers. And so for all of those little pieces of the puzzle coming together, which is not obvious to anybody, you know, it's not. And you were very selective about where you put the money you were very, I know you were very hands-on about where the money went and why and that's incredibly insightful again that's another I think another huge endorsement for what you've done and how you've done it because and this is for you guys watching you don't just get a really beautiful book with with beautiful photographs in it you you know that you're saving lives you know that the money's being well spent and you know that every penny of it is going to that that very worthy endeavor so I think it's yeah, that was a that was a surreal example, a, a surreal ex, uh, experience, and a, and a brilliant example of that situation, where the money had absolutely proven itself to be brilliantly spent. Thank you. I, I think the only thing I'd I'd correct in what you just said is you said that you know you Margot gave that money and made the difference. You know, this is such a team effort. Um, you know, yeah. that there would be no book without all of the photographers who donate their work. Um, you know, they earn a living from their photography, but they give their work for free. Um, you know, the, everyone who helped on the editorial side of the book. So in, in that first year, Keith Wilson was our editor. Um, I was working with Born Free. So the team at Born Free who helped and, and helped us get publicity and kind of promote. Um, and then also we, we started something that year that's just, again amazed me and grown and grown since then but um i had a few volunteers i i can remember we were supposed to be setting the exhibition up and i kind of arrived at the gallery and the pictures were being dropped off and i suddenly thought it's quite a lot of work to hang an entire exhibition by myself and i i just put something on facebook and so i, I don't suppose anyone's around and got a few hours have they because i right. could really do with some help right. here and all these people started saying, yeah, I'll help, I'll help. And they all kind of turned up um, like something out of a movie and rolled their sleeves up and started hanging and later on kind of taking down. And 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 our volunteers set um, has grown and grown over the years. Um, and, you know, it's like a family now. Um, you know, it's, it's wonderful. We, 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 we meet up socially now. We meet up on Zoom if, because we can't meet face to face. But... Um, there's all these unexpected consequences, beautiful things that have kind of, and friendships that have been born out right. of this series, you know, thanks to that elephant, my elephant, um, which, yeah. yeah. Is you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take the uh, unprecedented step of sharing your website, because while you've been talking, I've found this and I want the, one of the photographs that was coming next in the slide deck is, is coming right up. And these are some of the, you know, I wouldn't expect you to talk through these, but this, this is a moment right there that's margot and i with sudan and the reason i wanted to share that photograph with you is because for the simple reason that that's really what led to book two isn't it yeah 
It, it is indeed. So, so yeah, we, we were in, we finished in Meru um, and the, the next step was to head over to um, Old Pejita, um and um, see some um, wonderful friends of mine, the safari cottages there, go and stay with them. Um, and we, um, they're the, the, the last Northern Whites um, that some people will know about our, our house. So, with with um, white rhinos, there are around 20,000 left of white rhinos. They're the most populous of all the different rhino species. Um, but there are two sub um, species of, of white rhino. So southern white, which is the one that you see um, whenever you go on safari, and then northern white. And, and at that point, there were only three left. Um, on the planet, um, and one of them was the male called Sudan, who um, who we we got to meet there. And as as most people, I'm sure, watching this will probably be aware, Sa Sudan sadly did pass. Actually, only a few months after we'd actually met him, um, he um, you know he was the last of his line. Now, old Pedster, they're trying to. Um, uh, create a surrogate, um, a very complicated IVF process that's never been done before. Maybe they'll be successful or not, but um, that's not proven yet. And, and us sitting with him, he was a very old man at that point, very tired, which is why we were able to to sit and and, and spend that time with him. Um, it, it, that feeling that kind of came over me, the emotion that came over me, looking in his eye and knowing he's the last of the species that has been eradicated because of human behavior again um just got me like that like, like the elephant had before and um yeah I, I again i was just like i can't believe that you know humans do this we're wiping out everything i was so angry and upset about it um and at that point i hadn't decided there was going to be a book number two i I'd just given up 18 months of my life you know and, and put everything else on hold thinking i'll just make this book on elephants and i've done my job and yeah. and after we launched everyone started saying well there's got to be another one hasn't there yeah. um the, the question i get asked more than any other nowadays is what's the next book in the series but at the time i was like what series so that there isn't <laughs> one and, um, yeah but yeah. sitting with Sudan, I, I I remember that night at dinner, I just said to you, it's, 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 it's got to be rhinos, hasn't it? And, and you said, I yes. Said, yeah, I think I, I think I suggested squirrels, <laughs> but, <clears throat> but but that didn't come to be yet. But um, <laughs> but we'll see, we'll see. But, yeah, that's that that then led to, and this is this slide is working, which is lovely. I'm so glad you can see it, and I. Um, it's it was it was absolutely that moment. I mean, I I was asked just recently um, to to describe my most meaningful or profound wildlife or conservation experience, and it was and it was meeting Sudan. And you'll remember, you know, I was there obviously due to, in fact, both of us were due to talk to camera for um for your uh, your your next book in the in the in the series, um, or or we were talking about the the follow-up for remembering remembering elephants at that point and didn't matter whether it was me holding the camera to film you or me trying to talk to camera i was unable to for about the first 20 minutes because i was just sobbing like a child because as you'd said you, you you're you're li literally facing extinction you're watching it happen right in front of you because you know that this is the last male of a species and there's only two others who are i think you said are both there also his daughter and granddaughter at Olpegeta, and when you see Sudan, and it's, and I had no idea we were going to be as close as we were. When you see Sudan, I mean, that just took my breath away because everything that we care about, we, I'm talking collectively, Margot, myself, all of you guys watching because we're here and we, we care. It's everything we fight against and, and it's there in front of you happening. You're literally looking at the last male of a species. And when he was, as you say, he was an old boy by then. He was 43, which for a rhino, by the way, they they generally lived to about seven years in the wild because of poaching on average seven years. So he, he lived a very long life because of the fact that he was so, so heavily guarded. Um, but that, I'm, I can't remember a more profound experience with, well, in life generally, to be honest, other than, um, than meeting Sudan. I, th I think it was just a, a, an extraordinarily sad and profound experience at the same time. And it yeah. uh, so and that, led to this being the next book. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I remember as well that both of us actually sitting with him said to him, I'm sorry. Um, we actually <laughs> said to Sudan, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. And yeah. I, I feel like crying again, just remembering that moment. But um, yeah. that's how we actually ended the um, the the book, Remembering Rhinos. We actually said, you know, Sudan, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, and and it's interesting the books if you actually i mean i i'm i i spend such a lot of time writing um the pieces that go in the books um and i'm sure most people just look at the pictures <clears throat> which is absolutely fine but if you actually take the time to read what's in the books as well you kind of follow my journey um you you get yeah. to kind of understand the emotions i've had and and what i'm um feeling about things as we go through and and definitely right. that that book was saying sorry to you know to Sudan on on behalf of humans. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah you, you, you're absolutely right. That was that was the overwhelming feeling. I remember being so ashamed of what we had done to his species and just feeling this absolute overwhelming need to apologize to to try and transmit to him that we loved him and that we were sorry for what yeah. we, the human species, had done to him and his his kind. Um, but as with uh, very uh, uh, t um, aptly, if not tragically, um, as with Cecil the Lion, who I believe it's five years to this day that he was um, that he was taken, um, murdered, basically. Um, he, these iconic individual animals—I mean, not just iconic species, but an iconic individual like Sudan, like Cecil—can <laughs> drive the kind of change that an example of which is Margot and the, and the Remembering Rhinos campaign, which came next and was equally incredible. And then, of course, we went to follow up on that. So everything I've said about the money being well spent on the Remembering Elephants campaign, the same thing was very much the case with rhinos. And, and of course, by this point, you're still selling, while you're selling re Remembering Rhinos, you're still having people who then find out about the rhino book are saying, well, hang on a second, what's this elephant book? I want that too. And, yeah. it all, and it's just explain how it works with the, with the, well, I don't know if there's a better word for them, back copies, the, the older version, the uh, the previous books in the series. To explain how the how that works with the money that comes in from those. Yeah, so we um so I, I'm trying to just use my best judgment every year, balance with how much money we've raised on Kickstarter to choose how many copies we should print. And um so elephants that first year we printed two and a half thousand copies and they sold out in two months flat. Um so we were sold out by the beginning of December and didn't have any left for Christmas, which is obviously a, a, a happy position, but also, you know, to a control freak like me, a bit annoying because I should have printed more. But um, <laughs> when we um, when we went and did the the printing of rhinos, we reprinted a second edition of elephants um, that also sold out. We're now on the third edition of elephants, but. I'm constantly keeping an eye on stock to try and make sure we've also always got some stock available, um, which we do right now. I think um, back issues, we've, we've got about 800 each of the others left. Um, but so when people buy them, um, we try and divert um, the, the money from those books back to those projects. So um, right. if you buy elephant books, we're keeping track of how many elephant books we've, we've sold and therefore what the profit total is. And when we tally up enough, on that book, we make subsequent donations. So even though, for example, largely, you know, we've, we've been making lion donations recently because that's our most recent book. Um, mm. I have sent money out to, to Marna Pool's Bush Life Conservancy, who we've supported over the years um, with elephant money in the last month um, to help their anti-poaching work. Um, like everywhere, they're, they're in a lot of um, financial difficulty to raise money right now because the tourists aren't around. and. Um, you know, the donations aren't coming in. So um, the fact that if people buy an elephant book right now, they get something beautiful, but I can use that money to then support anti-poaching efforts right now happening um, is right. is wonderful. Um, and yeah, and people get into the series. It's great. So, you know, new people come along, they hear about lions for the first time, they look us up, they go, oh, look, there's all these other books or, you know, I'll, I'll ask for those for Christmas. And, um, and that does still allow us to continue to support those, those species as we go along yeah absolutely and and of course then we had a incredible trip to south africa tanzania and rwanda it's in follow-up to 
remembering rhinos. So again, that was with a view to 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 offering transparency to people, wasn't it? It was to show people that, among others, for I think on this particular day in the photograph, we were uh, with uh, Dr. Johan Mare from Saving the Survivors, I, I believe, and he, as you can see in the background, a rhino that has survived and is has been po survived a poaching. It's literally had its face cut off, and the work that Johan does is staggering. But we had this incredible trip, didn't we? Where again we followed up on the work that you had supported, and we saw that work in action and how how effective it was. Yeah, we did. So, and as you say, Johan um, is amazing. He he came to London for the Remembering Rhinos launch, and and there wasn't a dry eye in the house in hearing some of his tales about yeah. um, it, treating po victims of poaching and and um, it. The, the work he does is incredible and I don't know how emotionally he copes with it but um so this particular rhino um so he had treated um and actually he he was in pretty good shape at this point he was in a top secret location um we, you know we had no idea we wouldn't be able to find it again it was kind of um very safely guarded along with some other orphan rhinos that were there um, and the really lovely happy story about this particular rhino Sayer is that um he has now um, gone on to become a daddy um so oh, um, he was the, they'd introduced him to a female um around the same time we were there and and now actually future you know future generations are, are coming from that so you know some of the money that we gave to johan was to support this particular rhino and his upkeep i think that's a key key point you just made there is the fact that you know you save one rhino and and good, goodness knows as you say johan really goes through it when he deals with these um these victims of poaching that have survived and, and we, we we saw it firsthand didn't we? we weren't not not as you say this guy who was in pretty great shape um we saw the the aftermath of a poaching that had taken place and and no treatment had been given and we saw him in the field giving that treatment and um i mean it, it you know it showed us a lot didn't it in terms of for example this the sensitive nature of a rhino that's under sedation it wasn't completely under anesthetic but sedated and he was stitching a covering onto the wound and the and the rhino was flinching every time the needle went into its skin which is you know people actually it's actually a phrase having the skin of a, as thick as a rhinoceros every time the needle went in the, the rhino was flinching and that's under sedation that's tiny needle and then you wonder what they went through when the poaching incident itself took place and um we but the point i'm making is, is that you save that one rhino and as you've just described with this guy, how, how many does that actually mean in the future? It could, it, there's a, a ripple effect that, that spreads out from there because of that one survived. And this, this is a great example of that. So it's, it's again, just fantastic work. And it's not just the, again, it's not, not the obvious stuff necessarily, is it? Tell us about this gorgeous hound dog yeah so th this was we were visiting wilderness foundation africa um and uh, this particular dog is a, a cold scent tracking dog so she's incredibly clever in that she can up to 24 hours after poachers have been through an area pick up their scent so by then the scent is cold um, which is why she's got a cold scent tracking dog and she's not only can she do that but she can even tell if the poachers have done a figure of eight to try and um confuse the trackers um she can pick up which is the the warmest bit of the eight um and, and follow it off in that area so it costs around i think it's about eight thousand pounds to um train one of these dogs and then keep it and and donate it to to people trying to to track poachers so again you know through wilderness foundation of africa we supported um yeah. one or two dogs um so we got to meet her and and she was adorable she was adorable and you kissed her on the very first date uh, we can see that <laughs> photographic evidence um and we were actually there with uh, with dr will folds weren't we who again is yeah. like johan mary someone who just is absolutely incredible the work he's doing and the the lives he's saving um, yeah yeah this, this was an interesting one wasn't it the, with the plane it was a the, yeah, so um, so again, this is Wilderness Foundation Africa. So um, we were also looking to, to fund anti-poaching patrols, so going out looking for poachers um, down in South Africa. Um, and right. we were supposed to go up in this plane. And if you look closely at the tyre, you can see he'd actually <laughs> crash landed um, uh, on coming to pick us up. Um, and we didn't know because we were inside with the cold scent dog kind of having a chat there. And, and suddenly the 
the pilot arrived a bit sweaty and flustered and, and we we're like are you okay and he's like well i, I just crashed and, and nearly hit a tree, but, but it's fine and we'll fix it and i'm sure we'll get you up shortly and i was thinking there's no way i want to now get in that plane and you were like i really want to go and I was <laughs> well i was i was kind of thinking the law of averages the chances of it crashing twice on in two flights it was probably the safest flight I'd have ever taken. Yeah, well, thankfully, you know? neither of us got to find out. But uh, right. well, I, he did take off later in the day, and we were told he was fine. So that, that was good. Yes, indeed. Yes, but, yeah, indeed. again, it was – I mean, I've, I've since been on other um, kind of anti-poaching flights and got to, to see how they work. But, I mean, th these visits are um, – so motivating to me um it, it's you know I, I want to show people how the money is being used and that they understand tangibly how they it, it's used and also that i think so carefully as you say about how i think best to spend the money i you know i, I don't want to do all this hard work get everyone to donate their pictures our volunteers to work for free every everyone you know we raise all this money to to then have it wasted so it's incredibly important that I'm really right. careful with working with organizations who are reputable and, and doing great work and, and that fulfill our, our mission as well. So, um, yeah. yeah. And also, so you mentioned Will Folds, just to say mm. we were able to give him a, a, a donation, another donation um, last year from Further Sales Remembering Rhinos. So I think right. we actually ended up funding for him it was interesting it was a um an admin coordinator because he's like i'm out in the field all the time right. actually you know healing and, and treating animals and we're missing all these calls and and you know it's a bit uncoordinated so um paying for someone to actually take that burden from him and get more effective and efficient for him in the work that he does again it's it's not what i expected when i started i was just like they poached this elephant i'm going to put guns in the hands of rangers we're going to shoot the poachers job done um and now the the variety of things that we you know we, we've supported with funds from these books is is just incredible but um but it all, you know, I'd say it, it all really adds together as a jigsaw puzzle to make sense. Yeah, it really does. And I mean, I think you'd, you'd again, you, you've got to take a lot of credit for the fact that you're, you've just described a very, very common misconception, which is people think, well, shoot poachers, kill poachers on site, end of problem. It's not, absolutely not the case. And rather than just sticking to that belief, misguided belief and, throwing money at, at, at anti-poaching ranges, you've gone out of your way to find out what's effective and what really is needed. And as you say, maybe that's something as unglamorous as an admin assistant for someone who's in the field doing the work. But if that's the difference between him being out saving a life or not, that's absolutely crucial, life-saving funding. It's Yeah, and also I have to say, actually, I, I think there is a, Again, I've learned this and I've kind of learned it the hard way because, again, in the beginning, I was very much I want to support in a way that, that there's this phrase I've learned um, coming into this world called restricted funds. So I, I just want to, you know, I want to buy some um, night vision goggles or I want to buy 20 pairs of boots or 100 guns or, you know, whatever it is. And you get very restricted in your funding. And a lot of these organizations, you know, they, they can't run without the people running them earning a salary right. they, they much as they're wonderful human beings who would love to um, work for free and and they do work for a pittance they they do need support and so i i've become much more supportive of, of funding salaries for for roles that are being done by organizations where they can ask you know a fundraiser um as you say you know do a fundraiser for milk feeding bottles for baby rhinos and you're probably going to get a lot of money ask yeah. <laughs> ask for a funder for you know someone who cleans up their mess after them <laughs> after them and and it's people are less inclined so again i think with our yeah. books you know it's, it's my role to make sure that you know we holistically support what needs to be done absolutely i'm just going to echo what linda says which is on screen right now, you are an inspiration to us all. Um, thank you for that comment, Linda. Nice. There's a lot of those comments coming in, by the way. Um, and thank you for them. Uh, it's always lovely to have you guys uh, engaging with us. Um, we went subsequent to the South Africa trip, we went for an amazing few days in Tanzania, in the Serengeti, but then we went to Rwanda. And Rwanda, as well as being utterly incredible. I mean, it's probably the, one of the most extraordinary countries I've ever visited. And this is a quick example of the scenery. Um, whoops, wrong screen. Uh, here we go. 
just look at that backdrop. It, this is the the, uh, the Volcanoes National Park in Rwanda, um, where you stumbled upon, literally, not, not literally stumbled on them, but we certainly found them and met them in person. And one, again, another utterly mind-blowing experience was the to meet the mountain gorillas in Rwanda, which led yeah. to your next book, really, didn't it? It did. So, um, so yeah, we, we got to, to go and um, meet and spend time with mountain gorillas. We also, in, in Tanzania, um, let's not forget, we, we got to see chimpanzees as well. So, um, yes, of course we did, yes. Yeah, we, we stayed in Tanzania at the amazing Greystoke Mahali um, oh, no. next to Nomad Tanzania. But yeah. so I, I, I had a pretty good idea at that point that I wanted to do great apes. But again, I, I do have this thing where I kind of, you know, I feel like I want to have an engagement, a direct relationship with the animals. That I'm then going to dedicate a, life of, a year of my life to, to writing a book about. So oh. it was important for me to actually spend some time with with mountain gorillas. And, and what a... And a staggering experience it is i know you feel the same um oh. you you smell them before you see them i remember because there's the musk smell from them is so powerful and oh. and i remember a big silverback I, I i don't think it was Moninho who is the the one who's on the, the cover here but um i can't remember which family we were with but at one point we were sitting on the ground, you know, the guides were keeping us very well behaved. And I, I looked across at this silverback and, you know, you're a big guy and you, you work out and, and you were about a quarter of the size of this. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. were tiny and this silverback yeah. was just over. I mean, they're enormous. They're I enormous. couldn't believe it. Um, they're absolutely and, enormous. And again, I mean, actually mountain gorillas are one of the few success stories in conservation and that their numbers are, have been increasing thanks to, conservation efforts but there's still only around a thousand um you know and you know that they in in numbers terms there's very few um and a lot of the other apes are, are suffering um uh, you know a lot more than the, the gorillas that are being protected so yeah um so yeah we we decided on remembering great apes and and the wonderful ian redmond who actually um uh, was an assistant to diane fossey um agreed to to be my editor and um and fount of all knowledge um and and help us shape that next book and ir ir irritatingly i can see the thumbnail of ian but it's one of the slides that's not behaving itself i'm afraid <laughs> but i yeah. will tell you this i'm delighted to tell you this uh, um uh, ian is going to be one of our guests okay um, which is um which is wonderful. So we'll be talking directly to Ian, as you say. He he was he studied with Diane Fossey right there in the in the Volcanoes National Park area that we were in, and what an experience that was. And it will be wonderful to hear from Ian and his experiences. But as you say, he helped you with editing, remembering great apes, and that was another storming success. Just the most extraordinary photographs. And um, again, you guys, I mean, it's every single one of the books. It's impossible to. To, to choose between them because the, the the quality of the work in every single one of the books is just it, it's just jaw-droppingly beautiful so check it out check them out by yeah. yourself, do yourself a favor um and you know and how lucky am i that um say that, that books like these have actually you know introduced me to people like ian who've become friends and, and ian actually introduced me um, to Jane Goodall because um, he had the relationship with her so I was able to go and meet her and so she wrote the foreword for Remembering Grey Tapes at, at right. Ian's invitation which again is a, a huge honour um, to have her involved and yeah and as, as as we've evolved again I've got more and more kind of conservationists and, and people you know hugely respected in their fields involved in us putting these books together which um, it, again is a real treat. Yeah it really is and um but it's i have to say once again a little bit of a gush fest coming up but the reason why these people are are prepared to put their names and efforts behind what you do is because because they know how effective it is and the and the success that you've you've achieved and the and the the validity of everything you're doing so i think it's again it speaks volumes to what you're doing and it's an endorsement of of everything you've achieved Thanks. and that's why it will continue to be that you know um and it in it, it's just it's we could talk for I mean, and we do we have we've had the luxury of having many long haul flights together and um and lots of long long drives across africa together to talk about all of these things but i'm having to join the dots rapidly yeah. but 
but after because we could talk all night about just the great apes book or just any of these books and um but next in the series came the one we you guys have already seen this incredible book right here um which is remembering lions tell us tell us about how, how this um this came to be your next species um well i think that um Cecil the lion um, definitely, you know, influenced my thinking. Um, so, I mean, people are always asking me what the next book is going to be. And, and when you start to list all of the species that are endangered um, and that have threats and stories that you want to tell, um, it, it is just endless. But, but equally, if, if I, I know that if I do books on iconic species, that are going to be bestsellers, um, that will allow us to raise more funds. And actually, inadvertently, when we are, um, you know, supporting anti-poaching efforts, um, you know, around whether it's elephants or, or lions, um, we're supporting all the other species in an ecosystem at the same time. So um, going for lions next, really, I, I knew would be a very popular choice. Um, and the, I mean, this amazing picture by Federico Veronese, who's an Italian photographer, who's a really great friend of mine too. <clears throat> I mean, it, it's just mesmerizing this image. Um, and um, yeah, but but Cecil, um, you know, the, his his murder, as you put it, um, had been you know in, in a lot of the the media over the years and. And so I in, again that I I find stories there are things I want to tell like with cheetahs coming up there's stuff I want to talk about and stories I think need to be told and and Cecil's story needed to be told in Lion so um Brent Staplecamp who was the the researcher who basically blew the whistle on the illegal hunt um and was <coughs> excuse me um you know was the one who knew Cecil better than anyone else really um, he was able to to write his experience yeah. for us in in the Lions book, and and you know Cecil's story is immortalised now in that book, um, and will not be forgotten. Um, he will be remembered um, for you know his his part in in the story of lions and what mankind has done to them. <clears throat> I remember um, the the event at the RGS. I wish I could show the slide. It's it's another of the slides that's misbehaving. There. But but really, what you guys would be seeing is a an image of one of the most beautiful uh, i'd say iconic auditorium in london which is the royal geographical society which uh, again this comes back to the conversation we had earlier on where i know i've I, i've known your fear and your 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 concerns about will people show up will you know will it be, will it be a success and i mean just suffice to say that the we, you're going to need a bigger boat fairly soon aren't you it's kind of the rgs you're, you're starting to outgrow the rgs which is a 700 seat venue and any day now you know it would be one of, i mean perhaps with the world we're living in today that's not going to be an issue but it's it, it's just grown and grown and grown and i know that you have been overwhelmed on the night itself when you've looked across the audience and and i, and I remember also you've often asked people who've come from abroad they've flown in to, to raise their hand or to stand up and about half the room stands up it's it's an incredible level of support that you've you've garnered and rightly so but how do you feel when you see that when you think back so that day when you thought that's not good enough i'm gonna have to do something about this elephant that i've just seen and you look across for example for the last one remembering lions for which was almost a full house in the royal geographical society what how does that even compute um it it, it it doesn't really it just it makes me very emotional um it, yeah it, it it surprises me it, it says <laughs> so many things about this whole series surprise me and and amazes me um and i i remember even in the first year with um the elephant book i think we sold about 380 tickets and um and a, a, i wish i could remember her name i apologize if you're watching there was a lady came up to me and said oh i've come in from um Antigua for this and I, I was like oh you've come to England on holiday and she said no I've, I've come from Antigua for the event for remembering elephants because it means a lot to me and I was like really um and and it just didn't occur to me that people would do that and and yeah as you say it's it's now I mean people come from all over the world we have people literally from every continent um coming to support us every year and i i, I i'm just amazed and very grateful that that's the thing i, I should emphasize incredibly grateful well also uh, 
while we're talking about support, uh, Russell Crowe, Pierce Brosnan, Ellen DeGeneres, Kevin Peterson, Chris Martin, Ricky Gervais, the list is endless of all these folks who think highly enough of your endeavors. You guys will see some very recognizable faces. There's our dear friend, Peter Egan. There's Paul Kagami, who's the president of Rwanda, no less. I mean, this is, this is incredible. Joanna Lumley, Chris Packham, Virginia McKenna, all these wonderful, wonderful people who you guys will see if you visit the, uh, the website, rememberingwildlife.com. This is this speaks volumes. There's Ian Redmond. There he is with his what's the, I forget the name of the elephant on his shoulder. Oh God, I can't remember the name either. I'm, I'm so sorry. embarrassed. Um, <laughs> but uh, you guys can see that Margot has garnered absolutely incredible support from people across the over the years across the series around the world, and rightly so. So again, I think it just speaks to what you've created. You know, you're getting coverage in the biggest, best publications on earth. You've got a huge amount of respect from the photography community, from the conservation community, from everyone who sees the books, everyone who's involved. And, and again, I, and that, that shows, that's another reason why you get people throwing themselves at you when, they, when you ask for volunteers. And I've been there myself on a number of occasions to do the, the, the famous suicide photo <laughs> <laughs> on the wall there. Um, that's the same as same as me wanting to go up on the plane that just crashed. Um, yeah. I kind of enjoy it, but the the you've got a, an army of people. You've got an army of people who are there wanting to help you, bending over backwards to help you, giving all their time and effort because of again, yes, the, these people are wonderful, and they but but these are also very smart people who wouldn't be wasting their time on something they didn't see as being a benefit to the to the wider cause, and that's what you've created. Yeah, um, but I think we should just explain briefly why it's called the suicide picture before people start. Yeah, you go ahead and do that. I, you named it, so you'll have to. Yeah, you'll have to explain <laughs> it. Was even me. There's a there's a place in the gallery that we use, which is over a very steep stairwell that goes down, and we always hang a really really big heavy picture, and so it's got to be kind of lifted across this gap that if you fell down you would break your neck and 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 we're all all of the volunteers including me are always too terrified to actually hang this and and you kind of come in very strongly and bravely and and somehow manage to to do it for us so we call it the suicide picture because none of us <laughs> <laughs> although we had to then take it down without you last year and so i had to go and go. beg some stranger off the street oh, there you go <laughs> No, you don't know me, but please help. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's all in the mind. It's all in the mind. Anyway, he he, he was a sucker and he helped us. Um, but yeah, in terms of all the all the people supporting and and the you know and the celebrities, and I've had a lot of help getting those celebrities. Again, it, it's just wonderful that you know I've had friends who have helped me because they are friends with celebrities and. And it's, there are, I mean, I've, I've not mentioned the jewellery. We have an, a wonderful, um, Graham Nuttall does amazing pieces of jewellery for us every year, which we, we sell on Kickstarter. And I, I just think I've found something I've struck upon. And, and it, it's, it, I do insist that there is an element of luck in here. I'd love to pretend or claim that it was all terribly strategic from the beginning, that this would all happen. It's, it's you know, a lot of it has unfolded and overwhelmed me. But it's something that people can throw whatever skills they've got behind mm. and know it's doing good. So whether it is like I've got um, the reason I know precisely how much we've spent is because uh, the finance director, Greg Broadbent, who I worked with at my old PR agency um, for many years, Lexis, um, he's come on board, um, you know, as a, a finance director for me. Um, you know, the, the tiny fee I pay him on a monthly basis is not reflecting his value at all. But he keeps all all in check for me because I, I know it's important to, you know, have someone else managing all of that and it all done above board. And and whether it's that or someone who makes jewellery or someone who does a right. piece of art or um, someone who, um, again, one of our lovely volunteers, Rachel, her dad does calligraphy. So he does the certificates that go in the book every year. Just, Amazing. You know, whatever it is that we um, we need, there's someone out there who you know suddenly pops up with that skill, and 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 it's you know it's a lovely feeling to be such part of such a huge team, um, and you know I'm incredibly grateful to everyone, and and it's you know we we none of us individually could achieve this. It's only because it's all of us together. I I, I yeah, I mean I think it's very well said. I know that. Uh, you, you're you're absolutely right. It is an incredible team effort. I've had the privilege of seeing 
how it's grown and even for even from year one you know with the number of people who who lent lent their support to it and i've seen how it's grown from there into this incredible incredible community of people who who are one cohesive team and it's brilliant but you know they again it is a, it is fair to say that they're they're there because of the the validity of everything you're doing the and the and the credibility you've gained and the the leadership that you offer so it's 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 pretty incredible and um but gosh aren't, aren't we grateful for them um yeah but, but we but we for you as well and now um this year get ready guys if you haven't seen it already get ready get yourselves ready for this boom i mean what a photograph <clears throat> Yes, and it's funny. So the, the photographer Donal Boyd, um, an American photographer, a lovely man, um, that took this picture. Um, he hadn't worked with us previously. Um, I mean, one of the first things I have to do as soon as I've decided on the next species is is find a cover because before we can do a Kickstarter campaign, I have to say this is what the book's going to look like. So, and and we've I've kind of got myself in this trap, a happy trap. But you know, all of the pictures we need to have the animal looking straight at camera it needs to kind of look imploring not and it's amazing actually when you start to stare at as many images as i do the expressions that animals can have and mm. and a lot of cheetahs frown quite a bit because they're concentrating and, and looking into the distance so i didn't want a frowny cheetah i you know i didn't want you know a yawny cheetah it, it needed to have that imploring protect me look which i think we've managed to achieve with all of the others and and so I was searching high and low for cheetah pictures, found this one by Donal, who I followed on Instagram, messaged him saying, you don't know me, but, you know, I, this is what I'm doing. And please, um, you know, what do you think? And I got nothing. So then I went to his website and tried to track him down that way, got nothing. It spent about three weeks trying to track the guy down. And then eventually he popped up and said, oh, I'm sorry, I was having a break from social media. And I was like, don't do that. <laughs> but he, once he heard, said how delighted he was and, and actually, we just spent um, a few days together at the Cheetah Conservation Fund in Namibia just before lockdown. So I've got to, to know him personally. And he's an incredibly generous, wonderful, spirited um, man. And and yeah, we, we got um, to, to use that picture. And that picture is actually a cheetah that was the granddaughter of a cheetah that the Cheetah Conservation Fund had rescued um, and who had rehabilitated and re-released in the Arindi Game Reserve. And she went on to be... A grandmother so the the cub is actually a success story born in the same way as we're talking about um saya the the rhino having you know fathered you know when you save these animals and organizations like the cheetah conservation fund in this instance and save these animals they do go on to repopulate um you know future species so it's a it's a lovely circular story there that you know a lot of our funds this year will go to the cheetah conservation fund who without whom that baby cheetah wouldn't be around that's so wonderful that's again an incredibly uh, worthy cause and a great spend of the money so you got and you guys will of course have all the transparency as always to see just how that money's been spent um you speaking about this year it's a very strange year so obviously things can't at this stage happen in the same way that you've got you've got just for the guys who aren't familiar with margot's series uh, it's not just the books but every year there's the gallery event and then there's the incredible launch event at the RGS, um, which I, I was just describing to you as being this incredible venue. Um, and uh, it's become a, a, an annual thing, as you say, right from the start, you had people coming in from all over the world and it's only grown. Um, presumably that can't happen this year. Yeah, um, I, we, with huge regret, I, I can't see that we can safely plan for a live event um, right. in, in a socially distanced way that people you know potentially might book flights to come in for that then yeah. as we're experiencing right now could get locked down again yeah. um so i just i don't want to risk it <clears throat> i don't want to have the admin nightmare of people having bought tickets that we can't then fulfill um so we're going to be going online um but it isn't going to be just any old online event because i always like to do things a bit differently so um, I'm working on some quite exciting plans as to how to make it a real event um, and we're going to do the best we can to recreate the experience that people do have when they come to the Royal Geographical Society 
um, even from the kind of networking cocktail party that the, the VIPs um, attend through to finding a way to try and fulfill on some of the book signing ideas. Um, right. All our speakers who are lined up, so Franz Lanting um, and Chris Ekstrom um, from California will be there. Jonathan Angela Scott will be there again. Laurie Marker will be there. Um, so lots of the elements, but just in an online way. And, and, and I'm very grateful that um, obviously you've agreed to help and, and to sort of compare us for the evening as well and keep um, keep everything running smoothly. So um, tickets will hopefully go on sale in a couple of weeks. I just want to make sure I've got everything locked down properly before we put tickets on. But having been disappointed that I had to reach that conclusion, I'm actually now kind of excited because I think that potentially, you know, for all the people that did fly in from all over the world, there's plenty who would love to see and experience our events who just couldn't possibly dream of doing that. So now right. actually they they will be able to attend and, and be part of it and experience some of what you've described. So, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very positive about, uh, you know, I, I think the event's going to be very exciting this year. I think so too, and I think you know this. This has been a, out of necessity, of course. People have become accustomed to those online events. You know, we've seen it happen with everything that was due to happen because there's no other alternative. But I also think that you know the cumulative effect that we've talked about that your books have in terms of people, people who jump on board at this point with remembering Cheetah will suddenly want the previous four books. So it's yeah. it's incredible because you don't tend to do anything but grow. You you you. When you when you collect somebody new, you you tend to have collected them and they stay. And so that being the case, you know, when you imagine the numbers numbers of people, as you say, disproportionately to those who could have been at a live event in London, the numbers of people who could attend and who will then be interested for future future uh, books in 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 the series, assuming there is a future book in the series. Of course, I wouldn't <laughs> second guess that. Um, having said that. And you've already told us that it's one of the most irritating questions you get asked all the time. <laughs> any, any, anything you can tell us? It's definitely not squirrels. <laughs> Are you sure? Because no, I went through a lot of trouble. <laughs> Although if you could get Barack and Michelle on board, then maybe I'll reconsider that. Um, um, probably not squirrels. Then, hey, hey, listen, the, I, I don't, the numbers, they don't lie. Look, it says. <laughs> Yeah, and no, you, also, you get your, your cover photos ready. So <laughs> there's nothing, there's, there's less, hey, listen, there's less work for you. The, the, yeah. co the cover's done. Yes. I'll, um, yeah, I'll, let, let's see what the, the feedback is. Um, yeah. from this. I'll, I'll definitely consider it, Dan. Thank you. Do, you. do you know, I'll tell you, I, I, I actually created that because I knew you'd say it's not squirrels. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming and I, I I love that you said it as it appeared on screen that yeah. was perfect thank you so much that wasn't rehearsed Margot had no idea that was coming <laughs> I should have um, guessed when you asked for the fonts but uh... <laughs> yeah well actually the reason I asked for the font wasn't that that isn't the font the reason I asked for the font was I wanted to put your name in the same font on the uh, on the promo poster right but so uh, yeah um <laughs> Well, what I do know is that whatever you decide to, to do, the, that species and anybody involved in the conservation of that species will benefit greatly from it. You'll, you'll, you'll shine a spotlight on it. You'll raise awareness. You'll get people engaged. You'll do all the things that this broadcast is designed to do, and you'll do it in such a way that it inspires us. Like it's, you, you've, And you've, so the fact that you've come and given us this, this time this evening and, and shared the, the story is so inspiring, what you do. It's what you've done. It's it's exemplary. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. I know I know everyone agrees with me because I've been watching the, the the comments come rolling in as always uh, from from people who just think that it's incredible what you've done and it, and they're right. Well, I can right. see one there that someone is pointing out that squirrels are not endangered. Then, well, the Kiki and Dion, but, <laughs> but, but, but that's not to say. I mean. There's a, apparently there's a look. You know what? Joking aside, actually, one of the reasons why I'm absolutely, I I, I love the the fact that I've got these two little visitors to my apartment is because they they they're one of those species that get persecuted. Here they are, not not through their own choice, but through through man's involvement, through man's interference with nature, and suddenly they're a pest. And there's and there's literally a cull 
just like every, everything else that man decides is an inconvenience, there's a, there's a potential cull against gray squirrels. So I think it's nice that, that you know, you, since I've been getting these visits, a lot of people have been paying attention to squirrels a little bit more. And, and I've been approached by some lovely squirrel rescues and squirrel charities and squirrel protection organizations. And the very fact that they're required, it's, you know, it's indicative of the fact that they get a bit of a rough deal. So, however, we're Good not stuff. here to talk about squirrels. We're not here to talk about squirrels. <laughs> Not tonight. Um, you, you, I mean, you, you usually announce, don't you, on January first, what your is it? Is that right? January first, yeah, you announce yeah. what your species is. The last few years has always been January the first. So um, that I, I literally have not decided right now. Um, and you know, and every book is it's an entire year's commitment from me. I, I keep thinking to it. It's not like a, a normal job where you know you could actually give a notice period if you decide that you've had enough. You know, once I've open yeah. the floodgate on January the 1st. I am committed, like I am this year with, with cheetahs, all the sure. way through to delivering a book and launching it and, and doing all the wrap-up and, you know, publicity and things with that. So right. I, I have to take my time each year and I kind of catch my breath after the book and, and think, you know, do, do I feel right? And do I feel that we are still growing support? And uh, as you said, I, I you know, I, I don't take it for granted. And, um, you know, right. say people do wonderfully seem to want to collect the series and, and keep adding but i <laughs> some people also you know send me jokey messages saying i'm going to need a bigger bookshelf because i <laughs> if i keep doing this people aren't going to have room in their houses but good um good. yeah we'll see good, but there are good. stories to say it's, it's always for me there are stories that need to be told and and yeah. actually this year with cheetahs one of the most poignant stories i want to tell is the the, the tale of the iranian cheetahs which the asiatic the last asiatic cheetahs there's only about 40 left um, in Iran, you know, obviously a, a very difficult country to, to get to. And and the, the researchers right. who are doing amazing work there, um, you know, safeguarding them and trying to protect the, the end of this line. Um, a lot of them have been thrown in jail, accused of spying um, by using their camera traps, which is complete nonsense because a camera trap picture is, you know, only takes a very short distance. You couldn't possibly use it for spying. So it's all politically motivated. But um, there are people who have dedicated their lives to cheetah research, um, some of whom worked at CCF and who know some of the guys I met out there who are in Iranian jail for trying to save cheetahs. And more people need to know about that. So um, this book is actually dedicated to those researchers um, and obviously to the cheetahs themselves. Um, because if not, something isn't done, they're going to go the way of the northern white rhinos. So, you know, they just won't won't be here. Um, yeah. So we have a wonderful picture of an Iranian cheetah in there and an, an essay all about them as well. But so there are just sometimes stories just pull my heart so much. And I think we, we have to tell that story. And, and then that helps help shape the, the book and, and you know what we're going to say well uh, you know it's 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 just unfathomable how unjust that is what's happening with the researchers in iran what i mean it's so difficult to know what people can do about that do you is there any kind of a call to action is it right to an mp is there something that is there a petition that people can sign I, I wish I could tell you an easy answer that there it, it's in it's political it, it's incredibly political and I know that there was a campaign a while ago um, that was very pointedly timed when their cases were being reviewed that like people like Jane Goodall did video messages to the Iranian government and tried to kind of get them to persuade to change their mind and and weren't successful um, some of the researchers have actually been released, I believe, because of the COVID running through Iranian jails, but we don't know whether they're going to get re-jailed re afterwards. Right. Um, but it's, it, for me right now, I, I can't tell you a call to action, but I think it's something that continues to need to be spoken about because politically, if that, you know, is, yeah. is held against or held up, um, you know, hopefully that means that there might be some movement, you know, and that we won't let them be forgotten. Sure. Um one call to action that you probably can give people is I've seen a couple of comments come through from people asking how they can help. What with the uh, the campaign this year, I guess obviously the help that you need is going to be potentially very limited and different um, because there's none of the physical stuff at the gallery. There's no hanging of pictures over staircases or the RGS event. Is there is there somewhere that people can get in touch with you if they want to offer help? Um, well. Uh 
actually, I do think, although we're not going to do the live event at the Royal Geographical Society, I'm pretty sure I'm still going to do an exhibition, but just a week this time. Wonderful. Um, so uh, the suicide picture role is potentially still open, um, <laughs> open for grabs. Thanks, Ben. Um, but what I think we'll do, and I'm still working on this, but I think we might start selling some of the pictures in advance to fund them. So I might actually start to release some and say, look, buy this picture now. That will allow us to make it and hang it in the exhibition. You will be a sponsor of this picture. Um, and then you lend it to us. And once the exhibition comes down, we'll ship it off to you. And, and that will help mitigate our risk. Because I'm, I'm worried about, you know, it costs us, with the venue hire, close to £30,000 to put on the exhibition, which we normally recoup. But if we do that and then there just isn't the footfall, yeah. I, I could have wasted that money that I could have spent on straight to conservation um, charities. So cool. um, I want to kind of mitigate the risk. So one of the things is look out for our announcements about pictures and become a kind of sponsor by buying a picture in advance. Um, so right. I'm, I'm hoping come August I'll start doing that and releasing them and we'll have a bit of a campaign. Um, right. So therefore, the act, the actual exhibition itself, um, again, we, we will need some volunteers. Um, if people want to um, to join our volunteer group, I think the best thing is probably send a message to the Remembering Cheaters um, Facebook page, um, and we can capture you that way. Um, yeah, cool. Thank you. You're so clever. Um, <laughs> uh -huh. um, so yeah, ca capture people that way. Um, but again, obviously we're gonna have to be careful. So normally we've had, you know, kind of 20, 30 people help us put the pictures up and take them down. And, right. and now this year, you know, I'm gonna have to manage that so yeah. that I'm not endangering anyone because we're all getting too crowded in the gallery. So it will be it will be a challenge, but but spreading the word. So, you know, when we're we're trying to get the exhibition up and running and, and you know selling those pictures in advance you know it's sharing if you can't afford to buy one yourself of course but you know share it see if anyone you know might want to sponsor that picture um you know share when the tickets are on sale you know share pictures of yourselves holding the books you know if you've got them already right. um just right. keep awareness um for, for what we're trying to do um and with that in mind guys you can see the the facebook pages on screen the Twitter page. I haven't made a spelling mistake. That is it. It's uh, without the E in remember. Yes. And um, so do, as Margot says, do follow on social media. You'll also find the uh, website, I dare say, has links to those social media um, channels, yeah. right? Yeah. So get, get yourselves over there. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to share rememberingwildlife.com into the chat. So you'll see it hit right now as food for thought. So if you want to uh, use that link because obviously on the screen it's not a link you just get to see it <laughs> and um, and before we say goodbye to Margot I'm just going to say on at a new time a new day again because this is why we've done this today with Margot who's very kindly given us her evening uh, to share her story on a Wednesday which is absolutely new for us how exciting because we wanted to avoid J uh, July 4th which is Saturday for the for the American friends that, that watch this um, so on Sunday, the 5th of July at 6 p.m. UK time, so an hour earlier, on Sunday, the 5th of July, I'll be joined by Karen Paolilo, who runs the Turgway Hippo Trust in Zimbabwe. It's going to be an incredible conversation. Her story is incredible. The story of what she does out there in Zimbabwe is incredible. I'm very happy to tell you that she and I ran a successful test uh, of her, her, her connection, uh, which is only through a set, set periods of time during the day, hence the earlier time frame on Sunday um, ironically yesterday and I didn't mention this until now because I didn't want to worry you Margot either that actually my, my internet crashed yesterday for about six hours so there she is in Zimbabwe ready to run a test and here I am in London unable to because my internet's down so the irony of that wasn't lost on me but it's um, it's behaving itself now hopefully it will behave on Sunday and six o'clock uh, Karen Paolilo Turgway Hippo Trust please join us and as for you Margot Raggett Here's an interesting fact. Did you know if you type when I type Margot into my iPhone, it changes it to Marmot. <laughs> Marmot for a J. <laughs> yeah. anyway, we all look forward immensely to remembering squirrels um, and, and whatever else comes after that. Um, but joking aside, Margot, you're a superhero. Uh, we utterly adore you for everything you've done and continue to do. And I, as I've said, have the the benefit of knowing 
just how much of your heart and soul and blood, sweat and tears go into this. And so from the bottom of my heart, I can't even find the words to thank you sufficiently because I know what you put into this. It's literally when you when when people talk about those who've dedicated their life to a cause, that, that's what I've seen you do. And um, you save lives and we love you for it. Thank you. Thank you. I, I yeah. Thank you to everyone who supports us. You'd say it's a team effort. It really is. And, um, you know, and I, I thank you also for um yes being my counselor through through the years i'm so happy that um we we got to meet these books you know brought our friendship together That's yes great. i did i'm grateful for that as well and long may it last and it will yeah thank you margot and thank you all for watching as always um join us on sunday meantime spread the love see you soon <laughs>